We are back on the Zero Hour. I am Richard R.J. Escow, and joining us now is Steph Shearer. Steph is founder and executive director of Americans for Safe Access, which is the largest national member-based organization of patients, medical providers, scientists, and concerned citizens promoting safe and legal access to cannabis for medical use as well as for research. And she's going to talk to us a little bit about what she's doing and the latest political developments there. Steph, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. So just to be clear, Americans for Safe Access is an organization that supports uh, cannabis for therapeutic use, right? That's correct. So uh, how do you guys interact with the legalization movement, if at all? Is it, uh, is it just parallel tracks and no intersection? Or is that, I would assume that in some way the, uh, the legalization movement is helpful. Um, yes, I would say that you know, we definitely um, are aware of the legalization movement. We definitely um, have had some uh, of the same goals. Um, but our, you know, the, our um, constituencies that we represent uh, are very different, and um, and so I think you know the legalization movement has definitely learned a lot from the work that we've done uh, as far as pushing these laws forward, and um, I think you know sort of day to day we're really looking as we're starting to see um, both legalization and medical cannabis in the same market. Um, it is becoming very clear that these are are very different markets that serve two very different consumers. Yeah, and I would think that, you know, the goals for you would be, number one, the the optimum, the best possible treatment for uh, people whose whose treatment would be enhanced by uh, cannabis, as well as uh, research as, 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 and um, I guess the other word I would use would be just compassion. That's correct. The, the, you know, in 1994 is when scientists discovered uh, the endocannabinoid system, which is a system of, of receptors that cannabis interacts with within the human body. And what we have learned is that even though we're talking about the same plant, um, the, the products and the, the types of, uh, of products are very different between those two consumer bases. And while, you know, you're looking at, you know, for the recreational market, they may be looking at product development for maybe products that, you know, get you high without giving you munchies, it's a very different right. sort of end goal than um, patient advocacy where we're looking at, yes, the development of the standardization of, of products. Patients aren't looking for, um, you know, the next best thing. They're looking for um, the medicine that works for them on a consistent basis. And um, it, it's primarily used, Steph Shearer, uh, of Americans for Safe Access, uh, it, the therapeutic uses for cannabis. I, I, I'm certainly aware that it's used in pain management. Um, and what are some of its other uh, medical or therapeutic uses? I think one of the most exciting is, is for inflammation. Um, cannabis is one of the safest anti-inflammatories known to humankind. And uh, most anti-inflammatories... As you know, you're not even supposed to use more than four days in a row. So um, uh, it's also used to stimulate hunger uh, for people that have wasting syndrome or maybe someone who's going through chemotherapy and has lost their appetite. Mm-hmm. Uh, obviously, if you're not eating, you're not, gonna get, not going to get well. Um, it's used in the treatment of PTSD uh, to help uh, patients deal with um, that memory disorder. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, those are just a few, but it's also used for... MS uh, patients as well as Parkinson's patients to deal with tremors. Uh, it's a pretty pretty remarkable uh, plant uh, that has a remarkable amount of, of applications. And you mentioned uh, different products, and I assume by that you mean different ways of delivering the cannabis to uh, the nervous system. I, I, but you tell me, is that uh, when you talk about different products, are you talking about different ways to consume it? I'm actually talking about two things. One, yes, I'm talking about delivery systems. So in, in the medical cannabis um, industries, you know, you see a lot of topical applications um, as well as uh, tinctures and, and pills and edibles. Um, but also, um, you know, the cannabis plant is made up of um, almost 100 different compounds. And those different compounds have different effects um, on the human body. So THC, I think, is... It's probably the most uh, known uh, compound 
in cannabis. Um, but it has it, it has many medical applications, but it also has psychotropic effects, um, which is what a, a lot of people are looking for when they're using it recreationally. Right. Um, but some of those other compounds like CBD, uh, CNN, they actually have a different uh, your body reacts to them differently. So a, a patient isn't looking for something necessarily that is going to get them um, you know, as high as possible. What they're looking for is actually something that controls their symptoms um, with the fewest number of, of side effects. Which uh, and, and by the way, uh, we're talking to Steph Shearer, who is founder and executive director of Americans for Safe Access. In a way, Steph, I almost regretted asking you about the legalization movement as soon as I did, because I think a lot of people in their minds, in the public mind, kind of confuse the two a, a little bit. It, it seems to me, you know, as you describe uh, the different products and so on, that you're really talking about uh, pharmaceutical usage. You're really talking about something that can help people heal or or feel better. And um, yeah, I think without you know without any negative feelings about the legalization movement, it's it, it, it's a different goal and as you said, a different constituency. And, and do you have any thoughts as to why there's been any resistance? It seems to me to be kind of a no-brainer that if it can be packaged and presented in a form that has medical and therapeutic value, why wouldn't you do that? That is a great question. Um, well, I think there's a few reasons. I think one, uh, to be honest, you know, as I mentioned before, scientists didn't discover the endocannabinoid system until 1994. So that's pretty recent. So even though we had, you know, thousands and thousands of, of anecdotal accounts of people using cannabis in a therapeutic setting and feeling better, uh, it wasn't until we really understood the system that we could see what was happening in the body that they weren't just feeling better, but they were actually um, getting better, right? So, so that's a, a major factor. There's also some, you know, some sort of basic scientific uh, requirements like creating a cannabis monograph, uh, which is a, you know, it's an academic uh, report that allows scientists and um, and farmers to be able to talk about. Uh, the plant as an agricultural product to be able to really identify uh, what pesticides, if anything, can be used, um, you know, what, what to expect when you're actually testing cannabis uh, for the potency. So I think that, that you know, yes, there's definitely been a, uh, a cultural war in the United States um, against cannabis in general, but I think when you really sort of, you know, peel back the, the reefer madness, so to speak, it was really a lot of work that we had to do um, to integrate this medicine into society. And, and as uh, you mentioned, this is sort of a, a pharmaceutical application. And the truth is it's, it's actually somewhere between a nutraceutical and a pharmaceutical, mm -hmm. meaning that, you know, most, um, most uh, prescription drugs that you take are, come from single compound substances. And while there is, you know, other countries really look towards herbal medicines, which are multi-compound substances, um, the U.S. Is a, little, is a little behind in, in looking at herbal medicines and more personalized medicine. Um, but cannabis falls in that category, right? That you're not, there isn't one pill uh, made from cannabis that everybody can take and have the same effect. The truth is, is that each one of us has a unique endocannabinoid system and the diseases that we mentioned before um, actually um, are identified by a deficiency in that system, right? And so it's more like um, a, way, a way a patient would treat um, diabetes uh, with using the proper amount of insulin that their body needs to meet the therapeutic effect. So for cannabis, you know, for, for patients who have uh, MS or are suffering from cancer, um, you know, the, their dosage is really unique um, to their to their body. So, it's so, all, so, yeah. so we're talking with Steph Shearer of the Americans for Safe Access Group. So it's also a matter of training provide medical providers, I would assume, as to how to help people uh, find that appropriate balance. That's right. You know, as as a patient advocate, what's been very uh, you know, I, I founded ASA 13 years ago, and um, and I am a medical cannabis patient. That's what in, inspired me to start the organization. Um, and while I had some political uh, training uh, before I started the organization, um, you know, I really had to to create an organization that was an expert not only in passing state laws 
um, you know, drafting and, and passing federal laws, but also looking at, um, you know, creating a whole scientific board to help us uh, with the cannabis monograph, um, you know, working with people within the herbal products world to help us create good manufacturing processes um, for the substance, but also, you know, working with doctors and universities to create education for medical professionals in how to, um, you know, incorporate cannabis into their, into their patient uh, therapies. Interesting. And now you mentioned federal legislation. In March, three senators, Cory Booker of New Jersey, uh, Rand Paul of Kentucky, and Senator Gillibrand of New York, introduced the the CARERS Act, that's C-A-R-E-R-S, the CARERS Act. What is that, for folks who don't know? Sure. The CARES Act, it stands for the Compassionate Access Research Expansion and Respect States Act. It's a mouthful because it really is a bill that that is taking a comprehensive approach of both resolving the conflict between state and federal law, but also um, allowing medical cannabis programs to move forward in their states. So this uh, legislation, it would actually amend the Controlled Substance Act to allow um, to allow states um, to run well-regulated medical cannabis programs. It would reschedule marijuana from uh, Schedule One classification, which which means that it is um, highly addictive. It's a dangerous drug and has no medical value. Um, mm-hmm. To Schedule Two, um, which simply it, it still means that it, it could be it has potential for abuse, um, but it does recognize the medical value. Um, it would um, actually create a space so that veterans, um, that their doctors in the VA system could recommend cannabis. Uh, right now, um, our veterans who could benefit from cannabis therapies actually have to go outside the VA system um, to, to see new doctors um, instead of staying within their current regimen of care. So this bill would, would change that issue. It would actually create more opportunities for um, cannabis to be grown for research and for those products to be developed uh, for research, which so takes down some of those barriers. And then finally, it actually um, uh, changes the way that that marijuana is classified as it refers to banking issues. So right now, even though I'm sure many of your listeners have heard reports uh, about the $4 billion medical cannabis industry across this country, right now those businesses have a a real challenge um, finding banks that will work with them because of the classification of marijuana. So this bill really is is a comprehensive approach um, so that we can take the experience of now 40 states in the District of Columbia and and move forward um, out of a, 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 a paradigm that is a conflict to really moving cannabis into a regulated system. And in case people aren't convinced yet, maybe it will help for them to know that the New York Times editorial board ran uh, an editorial editorial in support of this bill and entitled it a sensible bill on medical marijuana. So uh, what's the current status of the Carers Act? It's got, what, 15 total co-sponsors now, something like that? That's right. And it's and the next step would actually be for us to get a hearing in its committee. Um, and then if, it, if it's voted out of committee, then it would go um, to the floor to be voted on. And we're feeling um, pretty confident that if we can get it on the floor, um, that we could pass it, and, and really the challenge is, is getting that hearing and, and passing it through committee. Um, but what's been great about this process, I have to say, is that you know, this is, this is uh, our first bill in the Senate. Um, so for over the years, we've introduced lots of bills in the House. Uh, but now that we have this piece of legislation, it gives us an opportunity to meet with senators and really have a much more concrete conversation about this issue. I think before we had legislation in the Senate, Many of the Senate offices we met with were like, well, when, when we have a bill, we'll talk. Um, and so we've seen actually, you know, really long, long-term opponents to medical cannabis, uh, like Dianne Feinstein out of California, uh, Senator uh, Grassley out of Iowa. Uh, have actually, we've seen them move a little bit on this issue. Um, and so I, I think that right now, if, if, um, if your listeners, which I'm assuming a lot of them are supportive of medical cannabis, we uh, support for medical cannabis has consistently 
pulled at about 80% support nationwide um, you know, for the 13 years I've been working on this. But for those listeners, this is really the time that we can move out of, um, out of um, theories about moving forward with medical cannabis um, and really ask our legislators to move forward and do something concrete. Well, where can people go to find out more about the work you're doing in this area? People can go to our website, which is safeaccessnow.org, and that's safeaccessnow.org, and you can sign up and we'll give you, we'll send you alerts. Uh, we'll make sure um, that you know um, who to talk to as far as your representatives go and, and give you some talking points to help you with those conversations. But oh. if we had just a just 1% of the people that supported us um, call their elected officials, I'm, I'm positive that we can pass this legislation and start 2016 in a time of, uh, of implementation and, and remove ourselves from this long, long, exhausting conflict between state and federal law. Okay, well, uh, thanks for coming on the program. Thanks for your good work in this area. Uh, in this area, Steph Shearer is the founder and executive director of Americans for Safe Access. Thanks for joining us, Steph. Thank you for having me. Have a great day.